You know, I had a similar amp to that. I had a, um, I had a silver face twin master volume twin, uh, with Altec Lansing speakers in it. That thing oh. was louder than the word of God. Good yeah, if you, if you want to, if you want to make a twin even more painful and heavy to carry, just put some <laughs> Altecs or JBLs in there. <laughs> It's, it's weird to think that there actually was a time that clubs were so packed and so noisy that you needed that amp. Exactly. You because that doesn't exist that. anymore. Boy, you can barely get away with a super reverb. I mean, you bring one of those in, I mean, uh, we, what are you going to do? We did our first gig back uh, from the quarantine uh, at a club in Orange County this last weekend. And I brought along this 1952 Tweed Pro that I use with my band Deacon the Whippersnappers. And this was an outdoor gig. I mean, there's 48 seats. They're all spaced six feet apart. Right. And the first row of seats is like 15 feet away from the stage. And I have the Tweed Pro on two. Two. And the sound person says, you, uh, you've really, you've got to turn that amp down. Oh. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, wow, my 1952 amp on, you know, 18 watts or whatever it is on two. It's too loud. Oh, that's for an so outdoor, aggravating. Outdoor show. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> so when when it so pretty early on, obviously you because you were into roots oriented music, you were into the vintage thing right away. I would imagine. Did you start collecting right away? Were you like obsessed from the get go, or was it not a thing yet? You were more well. Into the music. It, it wasn't really a thing yet. People just called them used guitars or old guitars. I don't remember vintage guitars really being used until. You know, maybe Tysco Del Rey started writing his column in uh, in Guitar right. Player magazine. That was kind of in the late '80s, maybe, and and then Vintage Guitar magazine started in the early '90s. But yeah, back back in the the early mid '80s, they were just used guitars. And really, what got me started on all that was that terrible uh, late '70s three bolt Stratocaster. It was like this thing is brand new. Why is it so terrible? <laughs> and then you know, then somebody said like, "Yeah, man, the old ones are better." It was like. Wait a minute! What? What are you talking? Why? How could an old thing be better? And and my dad right. actually, uh, my dad grew up. Uh, I grew up with him restoring antique airplanes, so I had a lot of this influence that you know, old stuff is really good. You know, they, the metals were better, the wood was better, the construction was better, and so it kind of just sent me down that path. Awesome. So, what were some of your first procurements after that? Well, you know, I was into rockabilly. Uh, so I went through the steep learning curve of Gretsch instruments. Ah, uh, indeed. And, you know, I, I have come to appreciate vintage Gretsch instruments, uh, but in the words of Duke Kramer, who was about 90 years old when he said this quote, he said, uh, on the days that they had good drugs, they made good instruments. On the days they had bad drugs, they made bad instruments. <laughs> And there's just a lot of really terrible vintage Gretsch guitars out there. I, I hate to tell you. So I, I went through about three or four of those, you know, had a Gretsch Viking, had a double cutaway 6120. Uh, I had a, like a early fifties electromatic non cutaway and, you know, they were cool as hell and they sounded great, but man, it was like you were fighting them the whole right. time. Just fighting, fighting, fighting. And so, you know, finally I, I realized like, well, and maybe the Gretsch thing is just not for me. So I've always kind of been into uh, old Gibsons, old Fenders, and then also this kind of weird thing of Moserites and, Mose right, yeah, yeah. and, and, and things like that. But, you know, even mm -hmm. on Moserites, it's like you really got to play one before you buy it because there's so many uh, wonky ones out there. Yeah, I, I remember, <clears throat> you know, after I met Carl up and we went to school in beautiful Stevens Point, Wisconsin, his uh, his uncle had this record uh, and it was Joe Maphis and Merle Travis. And I believe he was playing a Mose right on that record. He was on the cover of it. And that just, it just scared the bejesus out of me. I was like, how is it possible uh, for this music to be played? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so how early on were you exposed to this stuff and, and delving into like, you know, uh, the, the Merle Travis, Joe Maphis and Jimmy Bryant, all these all these cats? Well, you know, like I said, I was really into 50s rock and roll. So when I started playing guitar, it was Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly. And, uh, you know, that those were my guys. Carl Perkins, Scotty Moore playing with Elvis. They're still my guys. I still love that stuff. Sure. 
But then I remember finding a copy of the Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West Two Guitars Country Style right. album. Uh, and this is way before anything had been reissued or anything, you know, CDs didn't even exist yet. I found a copy of this record for 10 cents and I thought, well, this looks cool. And I, and I put it on and it's Jimmy Bryant and he's going, and I had that same reaction that you did. Like, how is this even possible that somebody is playing this fast? And so, you know, that kind of sent me down the road of, of those guys. Uh, you know, I discovered Joe Mapis and Larry Collins and Merle Travis and all those guys right after that, basically from finding used records at garage sales or, at the local record store. Uh, and then my dad was really into blues. So we saw a lot of blues guys come through Columbia, Missouri and, uh, and then, you know, collected blues records too. And so, you know, had a pretty good education considering that I was in a small town in the Midwest, uh, a lot of live music coming through and a lot of great records to be found there. So at what point did you make the decision at a pretty young age that you were going to go out to California and, and why did you pick California as opposed to maybe Nashville or something like that? Well, so I had a band called the Untamed Youth and that was my first touring band, my first band that I made records with. We were kind of like a 60s surf garage band sort of thing. And we had three or four albums out on a label called Norton Records out of New York City. And so we started touring and we would go to New York and we would travel all around. And and then we toured out to California. This is like in the late 80s. And, you know, I, I realize that it's very popular in the public opinion to hate Los Angeles. I'm, I'm firmly aware of that. I, I don't need you to cover up for it if that's how you feel. But... I but, you know, I'm one of these people that like the first time I went to Los Angeles, I was like, how soon until I can live here? I've got to move here. How soon can that be? It was like seeing Chuck Berry on TV. Right. And so uh, we toured out to California a couple of times and, and uh, made some friends and connections and everything. And so the Untamed Youth lost half our band members. They quit on us. And so myself and the bass player, who's also my stepbrother, we moved out to California. I loved it out there. I'm still out here. He didn't like it so much. He moved back to Missouri and, uh, you know, he's married and has kids and everything now. Uh, so Los Angeles is one of those places that appeals to certain people. And, and I, I really like it. I still like it. Well, the weather certainly appeals to me. You know, the, the weather is one thing. And uh, I grew up in, I mean, you, you can probably relate. It's like, there's like a two week period in the spring where it's so nice in the Midwest. Right. And there's a two week period in the fall where it's so nice. And then there's like that hot, humid summer. Right. And then there's like the, you know, four months of like winter, not really winter, just gray weather. And, you know, and, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't miss that. I hate to tell you. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. Cause I, uh, what you just described is exactly correct. <laughs> I mean, it's, but I have to say, Wisconsin in the summer is my favorite place in the entire country. It oh can God. be glorious. Oh, right man. now, it's really nice. I have to say, it's it's beautiful. It's not too hot. Oh, oh man, all that area around La Crosse down there in the southwest part of the state, or oh, yeah. we're uh, up there, you know, Stevens Point, like you were talking about. Oh man, it is so pretty. I love it up there. Like I, I have actually said many times, if I was going to move somewhere else, it would probably be one of those places in Wisconsin I just described. Uh, it does have its moments. My uh, my family's had a um, a cottage up north for years, and it's now all my siblings and I kind of share it. And boy, it's it's pretty spectacular. To uh, and of course, Milwaukee is a is a cool town. I mean, it's uh, it is a lot of stuff going on there. It's a big city, but but not. <laughs> and it's close enough to Chicago and whatnot. And so yeah, on and so I, I've I've had so many fun times in Milwaukee and Madison. And I used to play Green Bay all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, so I, I've spent a lot of time up there and I really, really like it and love the bratwurst. Right. You know? I do like the brats. There's no question. Yeah. And, I'd I, probably, and I've got the hookup. So next time you're around, I'll show you the the sweet, joint. Sweet. Hook you up with the real, the real stuff. Because, you know, you got to eat. <laughs> you got to eat. Yeah. <laughs> 